Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We are so pleased to bring you a two-week series on a topic that we have done in the past, and uh, you viewers are always very excited about this, and we get a lot of reaction. We're going to talk about professional photography, and we couldn't have a more wonderful person and, and expert to be on our program both this week and next week. I welcome to the program my colleague and friend, Tim Christie, who came to North Idaho College in 1972 from the state of Montana. And on a penalty's arrival, at first he worked uh, as director of public relations and then became a full-time member of the faculty where he's taught speech for many, many years. And I call him a master teacher, uh, and he's had a tremendous success with his students. But he also has this wonderful um, second, I call it occupation, as photographer. And at the time of the taping of this program, we were at the end of the academic year, 2006-2007, uh, uh, and our good friend is leaving us to go into uh, more work with his uh, other uh, wonderful gift. Tim, as we have in the past, welcome to the program. We're pleased to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm also pleased to have our two regular panelists, uh, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is director of public relations at North Idaho College and can identify with Tim's first job here Absolutely. that she now does. Uh, with that, Janelle will start today's questioning. Welcome, Tim. It's Thank good you. to be talking with you again about this subject of photography, your avocation, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and can you please tell us how you began, what your interest was initially, and then how it's evolved over the years, very briefly. Yeah. Um, it, well, it was somewhat accidental. I, um, when I came to North Idaho College, actually I taught here for two years before I became public relations director because I was replacing an instructor, Dick Heineman, who was on a sabbatical. And I... Um, when I became public relations director, at that time it was a one-person shop and we had, to, we had to have photographs. And so if there wasn't somebody to take photographs, there were no photographs. So I had to pick it up. So I took a class um, from Neil Everts, who was my first, time, first instructor here at North Idaho College while I was um, a teacher. And um, also I was motivated because my son was young and I was taking pictures of him when he was growing up and they had little Instamatics. Some people won't remember what the, won't know what those are, but they were little point and shoot cameras and the, the photographs were awful um, and because of the quality of the film. And so I bought a used 35 millimeter camera and I've hunted and fished since I was a young child. And so I started taking my camera and one thing led to another, and uh, I got real serious about ph photography. And then I decided in 1981 to submit some photographs to a magazine, and I was blessed to be able to have um, them choose one of my photographs for a cover. And I thought, this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the rest is kind of history. I just. I, I, it was kind of accidental, but um, it was something that I, I really, really enjoy, and I didn't know I had any talent or ability, and it was just something that evolved. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Welcome to the show. It's good Thank to see you. you. You are a very humble person, but I'm going to put you on the spot, and just so that our viewers will know the caliber of your photography, could you list maybe 10 or so of the magazines that you have had your photographs published in? Um, National Wildlife, Sports of Field, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, um, a, a very small publication out of the state of Wyoming, but it is one of the classiest publications, a magazine called Wyoming Wildlife, and they win national awards year after year after year. Um, numerous calendars, I've had calendar, photographs in Audubon calendars, and uh, Birders World magazine, and uh, all told, I have over 500 magazine covers. And uh, each year, sell between four to seven hundred photographs in publications all over the world. And Tim, is there is there more of a demand for a certain type of photo than other photos? How does that work? Well, it depends upon what you have to sell. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's there's a there's a wide latitude of different kinds of images. Uh, virtually every magazine that you pick up 
buys photographs from somebody, unless they have a staff photographer. And it's very rare to have staff photographers anymore because, as you well know, in public relations, you can't hire somebody full-time to be just nothing but a photographer because they're expensive. And, for example, National Geographic only has a handful of people that they hire as contract photographers, and the rest of it's all freelance. So the, what you can sell is dependent upon what your interests are and what, what kind of things that you like to photograph. And uh, my particular interest, more than anything else, is large, big game animals. I'm a hunter, and um, and take I'll spend a lot of time afield, and um, so I, I kind of resonate with that. But I'm also a, a bird guy. I love birds. My our backyard is just full of feeders and and bird houses and things like that that we we nurture that environment. So I photograph in my backyard. And um, I, I will take pictures of anything I can sell. <laughs> One more question. Sure. Okay. When you're out in the field, and it, whether you have your, your bow or your rifle or your camera, do you have that dialogue that goes on in your head about when you have your rifle in your hand and when you have your camera in your hand? When do you switch from photographer <laughs> to hunter? When I hunt, <clears throat> I don't photograph, okay? Uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very different mindset. I'm trying to put meat on my table. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. I take my camera whenever I go on hunting trips because what I do, I spend a lot of time photographing the ambiance, if you will, of the experience, the outdoor experience. I don't care whether it's backpacking or fishing or camping or anything else like that. Something as simple as, as a cast iron skillet on a grill with two eggs and a slab of ham on it, cooking is a photograph that can be sold. And so I'm I think one of the reasons that I've been very successful in what I do is, is that I have a sense of the mood of the moment that resonates with editors who are trying to give that experience to a reader. And, um, and I've also had lots and lots of conversations with editors about the kind of thing that they want. So it's, a, it's an audience-driven sort of thing. I, whenever, I, whenever I photograph, um, if I'm photographing wildlife, my my I, I approach it as a hunter, but the end product is different. Interesting. Tim, I don't know where you kept. I know you catalog uh, your photographs, and, and we'll get into either today or next week the process of selling and, and all that. Mm -hmm. But do you have an idea of how many photographs that you have collected over this time? Um, yeah, I do. Because <laughs> you're so good at cataloging. So. Well, wow. that, that, the, when I first started this process, um, I thought my memory was good enough to be able to keep track of this stuff, and that lasted for about 2,000 images. And, <laughs> and the problem is, is that I have um, currently somewhere in the neighborhood of about 500 different clients that I work with. And very, sometimes I'll work with maybe them once and then never work with them again, and then some of them I'll work with 50 or 75 times a year. And you have to keep track of sure. all of your images, there's a who's has what, and you can't, you can't have images which are similar to one another at competing magazines, because the worst case scenario would be, and metaphorically in terms of NIC, if we ran a photograph on the cover of our catalog and the University of Idaho ran the same photograph, we'd both be angry. And the same thing is true for National Wildlife Magazine, Audubon Magazine, and Outdoor Life Magazine, and Field and Stream Magazine. They're, they are in direct competition with one another. So you have to keep everything separated. Um, I have currently on file in transparencies, which are slides, which was um, the way, the, the preferred medium for, for photography. I have 127,000 images on file. And all, each one of those are labeled. Um, with a, a caption of what the image is, is about, and each one of them has a barcode on it. And so when I send those photographs to a magazine, I have a barcode reader and I pull the photographs. Barcode reader reads the photograph, it puts it into a delivery memo, I put it, send it out to FedEx and it goes away. And I can keep track by the day how long that image has been to that client and I, can keep, I have a running inventory for every magazine that I've ever submitted images to. In recent years, um, much quicker than I ever anticipated, the concept of digital photography has come to the forefront. And I now shoot 
95% of all my images digitally, and I have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40,000 digital images. So between your teaching and that, you don't sleep. <laughs> uh, well, I sleep, but fitfully. <laughs> my doctor <laughs> says, no wonder you have insomnia. Uh, the, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. And, but one of the real blessings I have been, my life is, is, is rich with blessings. And one of the great blessings that I've had is, is that I have been a college teacher mm -hmm. that has afforded me the opportunity um, that there are segments of time which are mine. And, and um, I have a spring break, and I have a Christmas break, and I have a Thanksgiving break, and then I have a summer. And I spend a lot of my time photographing during those times, and then I also my, spend my weekends oftentimes going places and whatever. Um, and so that's really afforded me that, that great luxury to be able to do that. And the other thing is, is psychologically, it has given me great balance. Mm -hmm. um, I can have an absolutely horrendous week at school, you know, dealing with all kinds of issues at school and walk into the field and go to the Tetons and photograph for a weekend. And, and it is, uh, when I'm photographing, nothing else in the world is going on. Nothing. I don't care what it is. Nothing else is going on. I am immersed in that process. And then I come back and I am totally psychologically, I've, I've let go of whatever happened last week and I enter the, the door, you know, completely open. And so that, that it's been an, you know, both in terms of time and also in terms of psychological energy, it's, I, I just feel blessed. Oh, that's wonderful. We cannot do this show without showing your work. So at this time, I'm going to ask our wonderful staff to put up. We're going to show eight of your, your photographs here, and this is the first one. Um, actually, this was taken at Kootenai Medical Center. Um, I, I'm always on the lookout for, for beautiful photography and beautiful subjects and I was um, my wife Kathleen went to the tulip festival over in over in the Skagit Valley and I couldn't go and so I was feeling bummed over the fact that I couldn't go and so I went well I'm gonna go find some tulips <laughs> and they were nearby <laughs> and they were close so I went over one Sunday morning and I, I spent an hour uh, hour and a half doing that and it was it was I, I, I just got, was immersed became immersed in the in the tulips and, and here's so, the next one of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's another shot actually that was right in front of the, of the uh, of the uh, hospital right there and they have just the, the Cooney Medical Center has such a wonderful display of flowers yeah. and you know they're easy to photograph and all those other sorts of things now we'll go to a wildlife photograph yeah. Which you've done. This You're is really, this, <laughs> this is called. Well, this a, is not. Uh, this what is, I thought it was. This yeah. is a moose of a different color. Yes, uh, <laughs> and not live. <laughs> uh, no, but interestingly <laughs> enough, and and d d d w I shot this with the specific intent is is that quite often I will have clients who will say I want to have something really different. <laughs> And I went, this is different enough, you know? And it's sort of, you know, out of place and what have you, so that's really nice. That was, there were moose around town for a fundraiser, mm -hmm. a charitable thing, mm -hmm. and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. Now the next one is, uh, in the real world of yeah, wildlife. Yeah, this is a real moose, and this moose is attacking me. It happened, actually it happened down in the Tetons um, this last fall, and um, he's not really attacking me, he's actually trying to get me out of the way because he has a cow that he is more interested in. And um, I was with three different photographers, and I stood my ground and shot three frames, two of which came out tack sharp and the other one was soft. And the other guy, the, after I got done, they, they, one of the beauties of, of digital photography is you can look at your image <laughs> right away and the guys go, I should have stayed, I should have stayed. Oh. So anyway. Tim, did you bugle? That no, 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 no. Uh, we were uh, this moose. This moose was with. He had five cows, and the cows were all just kind of. They could care less, and they were just kind of hanging out. And what happened was, is that the photographers we had accidentally gotten between a cow that had gone over here and the bull, and the bull saw us, and he wasn't paying any attention to us. But when we got between him and his cow, he didn't like that, and so he came storming in. And you can see his ears are laid back, and he's not a very happy boy. But um, anyway, I really like the image. <laughs> and we'll have our next one here. Actually, um, that, that's cut off just a little bit. Um, the, uh, the heads of both of those geese, you can see it in the end. And actually, this is taken on our, on our um, uh, beach. Um, I teach a nature photography class spring semesters. And I'm going to continue doing that. I'm going to do it on the internet. 
and so that I can I could literally be anywhere in the world and be teaching my photographs. But I take my class down to the uh, to the beach for a field trip, and uh, I was there, and the gosling got on top of the log, and I just went, "Look at this!" and I sh shot a bunch of images, and and that I really like this shot. All these are really impressive. This is uh, this is the cow moose that the other that the bull moose was was trying to tend and and uh, one of the things about photography photography is all about light and how to see light and be able to recognize light and the light was filtering she's backlit there and she, the light is filtering through the uh, the aspen trees behind her and the willows right in front of her there and they're they're wonderfully lit and you can see the kind of the steam coming out of her nose and and whatever and she's very attentive and even though she's not looking directly at the camera it's it's a it's it's got a lot of mood to the photograph this one i really like um, I, I am a certified alcoholic. <laughs> I, I, I love elk. Elk are one of the animals that, I, that just absolutely resonate with me. And I, I can't imagine spending a fall without hearing a bull elk bugle. And this bull um, was a big herd master. And, and I had been following this, this herd for about seven or eight hours and been photographing him all day. And, and another bull came in from behind me. And um, and this bull came running up the hill, and and he when when this photograph was taken, I was about 20 feet away from him, and I had a big 500 millimeter lens, and literally the lens was completely full of elk. And then he bugled at me, and and I I, I love that photograph. Where was and that? Ken? That was in Yellowstone. Here's the final one for this yeah. show. Um, this is this is one of those photographs that I show my students and talk about the concept of persistence. Um, and, and perseverance. I am not necessarily a very patient person, and, and many people think that you have to be very patient to be a wildlife photographer, and I am not one of those people. I want something to happen right now. And um, I was in Yellowstone, and it was the last evening, and I had to, literally, I'd driven to Yellowstone, and it was Sunday evening, and I had to drive home that night. And this big bull is on top of this hill, and he has a harem of cows up on top of the hill, and he wouldn't come off of the hill. And I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting, and there's like 30 other photographers all waiting for this bull to come down off of this hill. And he doesn't come, and he doesn't come. It's getting darker, and it's getting later, and the sun's just getting ready to set. And so everybody leaves except myself and another photographer. And just as soon as everybody left, the bull pushed all the cows off the top of the hill. Oh when he came down on the hill, pushed them down into the river, and then he crossed the river ahead of him trying to bugle at another bull. Oh and I ran as fast as I could to get ahead of him, and I literally set the tripod up and shot five frames, and then it was all over. The light was gone. And that was the last shots of the day. And and I I sent it <laughs> I sent it to a dear friend of mine who is this advertising photographer who had been there all week <laughs> for photographs <laughs> and he had he had left a half hour before this happened and I sent him this one and I said so you think that one will work for the advertising campaign <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote back and he said you snot <laughs> <laughs> that might not have been all he said <laughs> no <laughs> you, you no it wasn't that. yeah I, I censored it <laughs> and Albert. Well, it's very interesting how you go about this whole process of photography, mm -hmm. but, but let's just walk through, let's, let's decide that you're going to go out now for, let's say, a day, mm -hmm. and you've picked a spot, you've, you've probably decided on a place to go. Kind of walk us through what you would do. You, you obviously have to decide what equipment you're going to mm -hmm. take with you and that sort of well, thing. Well, and that depends upon what I'm going to photograph. I mean, it really depends upon what I'm going to photograph. If if I'm going to photograph flowers, I'm going to take different equipment than I'm going to photograph Let's gris talk about grizzly animals. bears. Grizzly yeah. bears. Um, I I've been doing this long enough, and I know where animals exist at certain times of the year. And so, if I've figured out where I'm going to go, I figure out what kind of equipment I'm going to be. I if I have to travel there, a long distance, I am there the night before, because the very best light of the day is the first two hours in the morning and the last two hours of the evening. And so I'm always there the night before. Um, I have a pickup with a camper on it, and I oftentimes sleep in the boondocks by myself, get up in the ne next morning, and then oftentimes if I know exactly where, and it depends upon what the animal is, if it's something that is not threatening, dangerous, like elk or deer or whatever, which can be, but typically aren't, 
I'll probably try and locate a big buck or a big bull, and then I'll spend the morning with them. Um, if I've got good light all day long, high clouds, um, so I've got some decent light all day long, I may spend the whole day with them. I've got a backpack, I carry food with me, I carry some water with me, I carry a poncho with me in case it rains or whatever. And there have been times, for example, in the fall where I've been with an animal, I pick them up at 6 o'clock in the morning before I can shoot, and I put them to bed that night when I lose the light, and I've spent the whole day with them. Now, when you say that, um, I'm taking it that you don't try to move the animal. You no, just try to be no. part of I, the, the backdrop. That's exactly right. And you let you, them do their thing. Right. And you just take pictures off and on during the day that's of exactly various right. things that they're yeah. doing, eating, uh, whatever. I don't, I don't try and interject myself into that particular situation as much as I would like to do sometimes. And sometimes you do it accidentally. I mean, sometimes things happen that you do accidentally and... and there are, there are sometimes consequences for that. But there are, there are times that, that I've had in the course of my career, I one time stumbled on, on a, on a uh, bighorn sheep ram that had pink eye and he was completely blind. And it was in a national park in Yellowstone. And I went over and told the rangers and they went, well, that's nature. And I said to him, I said, can't you put it out of its misery? And they said, no, we can't. It's against park policy, and I think that stinks. And I suspect that had I <laughs> had the wherewithal, I might have interjected myself into that particular situation because the animal was obviously suffering. He was running around in a in a hole in the in the in the sagebrush and and running into things, and mm. you know he was in great distress. You know he made a meal for a coyote someplace, but in the meantime he he died on long and painful death and and but that's not my place to do that um, but I try to I try to be one with the animals um, it's uh, many people perceive wildlife photography as being something that you go out and commune with nature um, I go out and commune with nature with the intent of getting as many good photographs as I possibly can I photograph in places that are protected for animals national wildlife preserves national parks other places like that because that's where the animals are and they're habituated to people. Um, I don't go out in the Coeur d'Alene National Forest and go looking for big bull elk, although they're big bull elk out there, but they, you see a big bull elk out there and they're going to run like heck. Um, and that's not very productive. When I go to photograph elk, I want to shoot five or six, seven hundred really great images in a weekend, and you're not going to do that in the Coeur d'Alene National Forest. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Well, you already you just answered one of my questions, but I'm going to ask it anyway because you mentioned um, Yellowstone and you mentioned Jackson Hole. But mm -hmm. can you tell us a few other places that that this business has taken you to? Sure. Um, literally, I have traveled all the way from the Arctic Circle to the to the Gulf of Mexico. I've been in Florida. I've been to the East Coast. Um, my favorite places in all of North America are Denali National Park in Alaska. Um, places in the Northwest Territories, Kluwani. National Park, which is in, in the Northwest Territories, Yukon area, um, Jasper, Banff, Kootenai National Parks, Glacier National Park is a favorite of mine, National Bison Range is a favorite of mine, and those all of those are well within, within reasonable driving distances. Being a teacher, I, I'm somewhat tethered, mm -hmm. if you will, <laughs> until two weeks from now, <laughs> uh, by the fact that I have, I have a weekend. And um, so I, I always figured that if it's within 500 miles, I can make it there for a weekend and photograph for the weekend. Um, so that's kind of my circle. Um, I've, I took two different leaves during the course of my tenure here where I took fall semester off. And in both of those times went to Alaska. One time I spent six weeks in Alaska and the other time I spent two and a half weeks in Alaska photographing. And my suspicion is, is that the good Lord willing, I'm going to end, in, uh, end up in Alaska again real soon. <laughs> Excellent. Before the show ends, I want to have you just give us a few tips for beginners. Um, photography is all about light, and being able to see light is the most critical thing that you have to do. And many people go, oh, well, the sun's shining. The, the sun is a foe as well as a friend. The best light is the very first two hours in the morning, the very last two hours in, in the evening. Um, and the, the second thing that I would say is make it simple. 
complex, very busy photographs are photographs that are not very interesting to look at. It's like the photograph, the very first photograph that we looked at of the tulip, you know. All of the yellows accent that red tulip. It's a very simple photograph. It's, 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 it's not rocket science, but when, you, when people look at it, they go, oh, wow, because it's, I, it's isolated. It's isolated with the bull moose running at me. He's isolated. It's just him and the camera. Um, the bull bugling, it's just him. And that's what it's all about. And it doesn't take anything to recognize what the photograph is about, so simplicity. Um, um, I think another thing that's really important is to be able to do some very good technical things. You have to be able to focus your camera. You have to be able to turn it on. <laughs> it's amazing to me. It's absolutely amazing to me. I've done workshops, photography workshops, where people have come to the workshop and they have spent $2,500 for a three-day workshop <coughs> and they don't know how to turn their camera on. They have just bought this brand new camera and they have no idea how to turn the camera on. And so I have to spend the first day and a half, two days, whatever, teaching them how to run their camera. And that does not make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, I tell my students, if you don't know how your camera works, you should read your owner's manual and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so the technical things, understand f-stops, understand ISO relationships, those sorts of things. So the fundamentals, and like anything else, um, fundamentals matter the most when you only have a very limited amount of time. Okay, great athletes are great athletes because they do fundamental things well in nanoseconds of time. That's what happens with great photographers. When the moment happens, and I have a real good friend of mine who says photography is long boring hours of wasted time and boredom punctuated by moments of intense, oh my God, did you get that? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. And I mean, it's, it's literally lots of times uh, a shoot is made or you make it or break it in a minute and a half. On that note, we have to bring the prom to conclusion. But <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the great news is that Tim Christie will be back next week. What a professional person he is. What a wonderful person. And we're talking about uh, professional photography. And you saw some of his works. The next week, we'll show you some more of his works that are different from what we showed this week. And I hope you'll be with us then as we continue our conversation with Tim Christie. Uh, and his work in photography. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.